has come up from um, OSU. He's an um, extension for, um, he's kind of juggling a couple, well, not a couple things, several things, but one of them is um, kind of concentrating on strawberries um, and uh, has been predominantly working with uh, the fresh side of the industry, um, but also processed. So he is going to go through the nutrient management guide that was uh, a 2019 publication, right? It just came up. Oh, we, we lost Mike on the front. Um, at there any rate, so I will leave it to you, Javier. Welcome. Thank you, Julie. So my name is Javier Fernandez Salvador, like uh, Julie was mentioning, and today I'm going to go over the uh, updates that we've done for the strawberry nutrient guide. Uh, this publication hasn't been updated in a very long time, so we are very glad that this happened. Uh, we finished the updates in April of 2019, and this is the first time it's gonna be presented to the public, so I'm glad to have it for you. So the first thing that you're going to see is that we've addressed, uh, the previous guide was uh, focusing a lot more in June bearing crops, and in this guide, we are covering uh, June bearing as well as day neutrals and uh, fresh market as well as processing, hence, uh, because we're covering both. And another important update here is that we are doing uh, quite a bit of addressing the needs of uh, organic producers, which were not at all covered in the previous guide. Now, uh, the first thing to mention here is, uh, it's very important that you see that the guide is, uh, will give you the, all of the, what you need to know in regards to fertility and nutrition, but it does not, is not effective if you have any of the following uh, problems down there that we have listed there. So including uh, uh, the right cultivars for your area, the uh, suitable soil, uh, meaning an example for, uh, I think that comes up to mind right now, it's not having uh, wet feet, right? If your site is not conducive to good drainage, then it's not gonna be a good site and nutrient guide will not be helpful to you even if you have any of those conditions as well as uh, pests and of course adequate and proper irrigation um, and then uh, we are also the the main things that we're trying to address the objectives of these publications uh, is number one uh, how much fertilizer to apply two uh, when it should be applied depending on the different characteristics of your crop three uh, what source of materials are best to apply depending on the different types of production? And then for which application method is the best for the different products that you're applying? And we'll go over that uh, through the different things in the publication that we're going to look at right now. So uh, the first part of the publication cover all the pre-planned uh, considerations, right? And this includes um, uh, in general, what is uh, the depth for planting and working with raised beds and that kind of thing, or if you're working with flat ground. And then uh, on the right, you're going to see, uh, yeah, you can see the hand over here. <laughs> you're going to see all of the different options that we have for planting uh, day neutrals, uh, summer planting and fall planting, as well as June bearing crops, which are mostly spring planted, right? And then, or also as well as fall planting. Then you make some notes about the organic and conventional systems. And this is important because we are covering everything that has to do with the National Organic Program Regulation. So if you um, are looking at anything in this guide, it's going to refer exclusively to things that are compliant with that regulation. Okay. Then after that, uh, it also talks a little bit about uh, the type of soil preparation that you could do, uh, the type of uh, 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 subsoiling, uh, disking, and other types of tillage that you need uh, for uh, working either on flat ground or in raised bed. And the previous pictures also covered the two difference, the differences between the two states. In the top, you're going to see what it's usually uh, the growing method in Oregon for June bearers on a flat ground versus the uh, one in Washington um, where you might see some more use of a raised bed. And as well as in this photo, which is in the case of plastic culture, where you're definitely going to see it with raised bed. And then you'll see different uh, things. Like, for example, in this photo, you have um, a mulching done with straw in between the aisles. 
So all, all of these practices are mentioned and vary between uh, different uh, production types and regions. Um, we're going to talk about soil testing, and this would remind you of the right depth and also the types of testing that you could do. Um, and it's important to note that, for example, if you have, uh, you could do a six inch depth or you can go all the way to 12. And it also makes a recommendation for if you are going to go with both. So um, it has quite a bit of uh, useful uh, guides for any uh, producer under different types of uh, production. Okay, and um, it also uh, tells you about uh, uh, the, uh, where am I right now? Okay, uh, it will also reference anything uh, about when to do the soil sampling. And uh, as you know, uh, the only thing that we haven't really covered is soil sampling for greenhouse production. Because the amount of greenhouse production that we do in Oregon and Washington in general is not that, uh, much <laughs> so it's something that we'll probably be addressing in the future so the majority of what you're covering here is uh, for open open field right um, and then uh, we're going to go at the recommendations that you would uh, need to have the suggested levels for nutrients in the soil uh, for uh, when you're doing preparing for planting or uh, amendments that you need prior to planting so in the case, in, for example, in this case, we're looking at phosphorus, and then of course, the different types of sampling that you would do, a Bray-1 for a certain region, or Olsen for another type of region, right? Another uh, more calcareous soil would require for you to do an Olsen test, whereas if you're in the Willamette Valley, uh, you're probably going to go with the Bray-1. So that's important thing, an important thing to note if you are uh, requesting that um, uh, test from your uh, lab. And then the levels for potassium, calcium, magnesium, and boron. Now, we don't cover all of the nutrients here because uh, soil sampling might not be adequate for all of those nutrients. Um, for example, the easiest case is nitrogen, right? If you send a soil uh, sample, depending on the time when you took it, it will give you a baseline of what is available at that point in time, but that doesn't necessarily reflect on the fertility that you need to add. Whereas when you talk about phosphorus, calcium, those are pretty immobile in the soil. So uh, if you are in a deficient amount, you can add those and get to the right point. But for nitrogen sample, we had other strategies that you can use also mentioned in this guide. And then we go uh, I, I'm quite in detail into the uh, part that refers to soil pH. And as you know, the soil pH is, uh, for strawberries is 5.4 to 6.5. And uh, this is really good because we are covering the different types of limes that are available in the market, which in the past it used to, it used to just say calcium carbonate. Now it refers to the, the different types that you could do with liquid limes, um, uh, organic compliant limes, prilled, uh, granular, and as well as uh, the com more common uh, dusted lime that is the one of cheaper access. Uh, and then uh, also it refers to something that is very important because you want to request these when you are doing uh, uh, sending, uh, choosing your lab and sending the samples to the lab, which is the SMP buffer. That will tell you, uh, it's the table that you see below, it will give you a number to what is the amount of lime that you want to apply to get to that um, amount, that, that target pH that you're going for. So this is something that was not uh, specified clearly in the previous guide. So that's something that we've also added. Okay, and um, also there is a note on soil electrical conductivity, which in general is not uh, such a big problem in the valleys because the amount of rain that we get in the winter, but for other regions, uh, in, let's say east of the Cascades, might be something that is very useful. So we also included that for you. And then we're going to talk about uh, organic amendments. Uh, we and, and when we're talking about referring to organic amendments, it's mostly for um, adding organic matter to your soil. As you know, strawberries thrive with a good organic uh, organic matter content and uh, in uh, in your um, in your soil. So we refer to the different options that you have, including manures, compost, and recommendations for those. There's uh, some guidance that you need, definitely need to follow for using fresh manures. Uh, because of uh, uh, strawberries being in contact with the soil and times of application so that you don't have food safety risks later, as well as composting. 
um, and the types of compost that you use, whether it's uh, um, animal manure-based compost or uh, 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 vegetable waste compost or any type of different options. So we cover all of that in the guide. Um, and then also the really big important recommendation for growers that test your amendments. If you're going to be applying large amounts of these different amendments, it's really good for you to know that what are you going to be applying that is not going to be changing your pH too much. That, for example, if it's very high in the carbon-nitrogen nitrogen ratio and you have a lot of carbon, that is not going to be immobilizing your nitrogen right away when you're trying to uh, apply it for the crop. Um, and then also, um, another thing is the salt content in all of these different organic amendments. It can vary widely and it can really affect your crop if it hasn't been uh, uh, managed properly. So testing is a really good way for you to see what's going on. And um, another thing uh, we mentioned briefly, uh, the, some characteristics of soil health, and we are focusing specifically on some soil-borne diseases. And this is something that I'm very interested in looking and working with uh, pathologists in the future to make uh, some specific uh, guidance and documents like such as this that will cover um, uh, diseases and other things for you to consider prior to planting. But again, like I mentioned before, this guidance, this guide is focusing exclusively on nutrition, but it mentions other problems for you to consider, including a good example would be nematode testing, right? If, you, as, if you're going to do some uh, soil sampling, you might as well take an extra soil sample and send it to see if you have where your nematodes are uh, in amounts on, and types of nematodes that you have in the soil prior to planting. Um, okay, um, then uh, the guide goes into the, this, this part is really interesting because we're covering everything that has to do with how to collect samples. It's very important to know the time. So uh, one of the references that we're using is, for example, if you're testing a June bearer, where you're going to have a high amount of, again, let's use nitrogen as an example, if you test in the spring, and a much lower amount if you test in the fall, the right amount, uh, the right time for you to test for those, uh, for, for that test to be representative to what we have on the recommend, in the recommended guide would be in the summer. So we make references to all of these things on when to test, what types of leaves to take, because if you really are testing uh, the not the adequate leaf, then it's really not going to be the, the nitrogen content that you have from your result might be too high and not uh, able to be compared to what we have in the guide. So all of those little details are, are included here. And uh, yeah, same here. Uh, we are also covering uh, day neutrals for a certain type, for the, whereas we, when we're uh, sampling June bears is a complete different type of testing. In the case of um, uh, day neutrals, you want to probably test during the peak of the production season. That is the time where you're going to have the, the results that are most representative to what we have available in the guide. So that's uh, another thing. All of these recommendations listed that you can look at detail in the publication. And then um, we go over all of these. This is the most useful part, I think, of the guide, especially with tissue testing, is that you have a recommendation of the right levels for you to have that concentration of different nutrients for June bearer bearers as well as day neutrals for uh, the, the most important uh, macro and micronutrients. So uh, this, this is one of the key parts of the um, guide. And this has been updated with, in the case of June bears, the most important information from Oregon, and in the case of day neutrals, uh, a lot of the informational uh, or information get, getting them it from uh, UC Davis in California. Uh, this is one of the actually the projects that I want to uh, look at in the future is uh, uh, starting our own day neutral guidelines for uh, the Pacific Northwest and the Willamette Valley in general, the valleys in general, right? With our own. Uh, testing and our own trials uh, to go over that instead of using the information that is exclusively available from California. And then we get to the nutrient fertility part. And this is something important because here uh, we are also giving you a tool uh, that refers to uh, yield. Uh, Bernadine uh, was able to, Bernadine Strick was able to uh, uh, do a little bit of a uh, a sampling of fruit in the past seasons and based on that determine the amount of uh, nitrogen that gets 
taken out at harvest time. So for example, if you are uh, yielding uh, anything uh, between uh, 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 for five tons, for example, of yield, you will be removing uh, 9.65 pounds of nitrogen. And then it does the same kind of calculation for nitrogen and phosphorus. And that is a useful tool that you could uh, add to your soil tissue and recommended amount in general for your crop use. Uh, but that also gives you an idea of how much you're taking out based on your yield. So very useful tool. Um, then we go into the different sources. And this part is really important because we are covering, uh, this is something that the previous guide did not have at all, but this is covering uh, the, all of the different types of manures that are available. So we have a few growers that are close to dairy facilities and that might have easy access to uh, a dairy uh, manure. And it's very useful for them to get this guideline, right? Now, they, that doesn't prevent you, of course, from probably having to test that, uh, depending on the time of the year and um, uh, the type of feed that that livestock might be getting. It's important for you to know what you're applying. Um, but then we have this basic uh, guideline for all of the different types of manures that are available there. And uh, it, it, will, it will get you started at least, right? Then we go into the details of organic fertilizers, a lot of um, uh, production uh, in Oregon and Washington switching to, especially in the fresh side, uh, trying to tap that market, that organic market. And uh, it gives you a very good breakup of the different contents of uh, meal, alfalfa meals or animal-based meals, as well as uh, mined minerals and, um, for, for, for example, phosphorus and potassium. So very useful guide that you have there. And then uh, this was included in the guide before, uh, but basically uh, covering all the different uh, synthetic fertilizers that you would use in uh, conventional production. So it covers all of the different types. And as you know, uh, strawberries prefer um, uh, nitrate nitrogen uh, than better, that more than ammonium nitrate, uh, for example, what is completely the opposite in blueberries. So it's important for you to know that um, uh, the, the uh, different sources that you have and what you're giving to, to the plant, of course. And then um, we go over what we mentioned before, the different types, powder, granular, pelletized, uh, based on the different products or even liquid for fertigation that comes next. But then also on the right, you can see that we have the example for fertility uh, fertilizer calculations. So you can easily uh, use these to determine what is, are the amounts that you want to apply for the different products based on the table of what should be coming in that product that I showed you before. And then we go into, this is also that something that was not covered in the previous guide. Uh, we go into the details of how to um, use a fertigation system, what are the components, and a very detailed example on the right on uh, fertigation calculations. And this is both for organic and conventional systems. Uh, especially if you're producing and you're seeing that switch to day neutral fresh market production that is grown in plastic. Fertigation is a very important tool and uh, technology that you can use and having this guidance on how to calculate those with liquids is very useful. Um, then uh, we're going to cover a little bit about foliar applications. And uh, as you know, uh, probably the majority of foliar uh, applications, if you want to try to uh, give any of the macronutrients to the plant. Um, foliar applications are not useful for that. That's something that you probably want to address through the soil. But it gives you a little bit of information about micronutrients like boron and zinc, where fertilizer application in a foliar way is useful and can be useful through the season. Um, then we go into the detail again for nutrient recommendations, separating between June bearing and day neutrals. And then we go into the most important uh, uh, nutrients. We're starting with nitrogen, and uh, it will cover all of the critical times and grow periods for the plant when the uptake is the best and what times you should be applying these different fertilizers. And it also gives you a recommendation that it didn't have before, uh, where, for example, if you are using a type of urea product, um, where it's readily available for the plant, 
if you were looking at an organic product that would be taking two or three months to be uh, mineralized and available to, for the plant. So we have all of those different recommendations added here. And uh, then this note on the right also on the timing for application and separating between June bearer cultivars and uh, also, oh, one more thing that I wanted to mention. They're uh, uh, talking about the nutrition that you need for establishment, pre-planting, establishment, and then for an established planting. So in the case of um, the June bearing crops, the majority of your fertility is going to be applied and your amendments prior to planting. Whereas when you're in the second year, the fertility will be applied after renovation. So it covers all of these details on the adequate times, the appropriate times that will uh, be better suited for your production. And then uh, it, it covers the amount. So for example, this is the pre-plant that you would do and then establish plantings, the amounts to apply in the spring, the amounts to apply in the summer, when is it recommended? So for example, here, what I was saying before, in established June bearing planting, it's not recommended to apply anything in the spring. The majority of your application is going to be in the summer at renovation, right? So all of these types of recommendation, everything detailed uh, through the publication. Uh, uh, same for uh, day neutral cultivars. And then we go into the details for phosphorus and potassium. Of course, knowing that phosphorus and potassium are a lot less mobile unless you're applying it in a liquid form, so uh, considering those prior to planting and also uh, when you choose a, a granular fertilizer that it has the right amount that will uh, go with what you obtained in your tissue test. And then it goes into the details again for June bearing cultivars and uh, the neutrals and then we cover um, uh, sulfur, calcium and uh, I'm, I'm very glad to be here today because we are starting to pick up again on all of these different things that have, haven't been looked at in Oregon and Washington for a while uh, in regards to, in general, production of strawberries. Um, uh, there hasn't been a strawberry agent in, uh, in Oregon. I don't know, Matt, if you can help me with about how long? Yeah, about maybe about six to eight years. So um, when we started, I started to make a collection of the different uh, nutrient deficiencies that you can see so that a grower can actually uh, recognize them in the field. And the idea is to continue that type of project in the future where we are taking uh, the symptoms and how they are showing in the field for different cultivars. Make a collection and then at some point probably put a publication with a visual guide for growers to be able to look at all of these different deficiencies. So for example, there we were looking at a calcium deficiency before where you have that curling at the end of, of the leaf and you have the kind of look burnt around the edges and these kind of reddening that you would see on the tips for magnesium. So um, I wish that uh, we, uh, I'm really hoping that we get to the point where we have that for all the nutrients and that is available for the growers and we will be working on that hopefully in the future for it. And then uh, the publication goes, keeps on going into the details of iron, manganese, boron, zinc, and copper, right? You're going to cover all of that part. And then um, making a, a little bit of a reference of containerized transplants. And this is something that I'm also working on right now with uh, a research grant from the Agricultural Research Foundation, where we're looking at substrate production in benches. This is something that, uh, although there has been some growers that, are, uh, that have been doing this in the state, we are really uh, trying to address uh, a few things with that research. And we need to know fertility requirements for substrate using fertigation. But at the same time, those trials could be very useful because it gives you off-season production and a ton more um, ease of harvest where you're going to be depending on labor a lot more. Uh, that's something that we found out with the different growers that have uh, been talking to us, that it's the main challenge right now is the availability and um, costs of labor, as of course you probably know. But and yeah, that is basically what we covered. And another important thing, we have an updated resource list at the end where we are covering uh, a specific guides on how to collect your soil samples, uh, the different labs that are available, then the, uh, where, what type of um, test you're going to be requesting for a specific region, 
uh, we have um, uh, some research on uh, re applying uh, lime and how to raise your pH. And uh, then uh, something that came out from uh, Washington State University with uh, Lisa DeVetter that's still working on this, uh, biodegradable plastic mulches, another guide that we have included here, as well as, uh, for example, something uh, talking about plant available nitrogen from manures um, and uh, insect management guides and other different uh, resources for you to uh, quickly uh, go through with these links. And I uh, also wanted to just quickly uh, thank everyone that was involved in the publication, of course, Bernadine Strick and uh, her uh, uh, instructor assistant, uh, Emily Dixon, as well as uh, Lisa DeVetter and the industry. Uh, we run uh, all of the different parts of this guide through the different uh, faculty and uh, in, in different specialties at the university but also through growers. As a matter of fact, Matt was one of the person, uh, one of the growers that was uh, helping us to take a look at all of the different things that we're putting out there for you. So thank you so much. And uh, I will be very glad to take any questions. Are there any, Mike, you wanna? So, so on your day neutral, when you're gonna go multiple seasons on plastic, so do you look at that front loading of minerals, you know, when you're going to be out there, we don't, we don't, hopefully three, maybe four years, we'll see. On a day neutral, are you looking at that or in your future projects, will you look at that? Future projects, yes. I, I, my, I, am, I, I know a lot about June bearing production, but I really think that if there's any future for the industry, it will have to be with the neutrals. Uh, so that's hopefully what we are looking for in the future. We really want to address that need. And I don't see us doing day neutral as an eight-month crop. It's a multi-year crop. Right. Okay. That's and that is, is unique. That is something that we've also mentioned in the guide because in California, it's an annual crop, uh, mostly because of the type of rotations that they have to do and uh, to avoid the amount of Brazilian wilt and other uh, problems that they have down there. But here, to make it, because of our short growing season, it is very important uh, for growers to be able to know how to manage it through one, two, or three seasons sometimes. So yeah, that's something that we'll be definitely looking at. And also, please, uh, I'm going to give another talk later on our uh, low tunnel research. I would really like for you to attend. Uh, we will cover a few of those things there. All right, any other questions? Thank you so much, Javier. This oh, is great, sure. very insightful. Thanks so much.